Joshua Gracie, glad you are with us. Thanks for joining us. Um, my name is Nancy Turbeck Berry. As you probably know, I am the chair of the Coalition for the Freedom Amendment. And oh, a month or two ago when we announced the coalition, we told you we would from time to time be telling you about groups that were joining the coalition. And I am very happy today to be introducing you to um, the newest group to join us, the Doctors for Freedom. Um, the uh, medical professionals in South Dakota are a terrifically important voice uh, on the topic of reproductive rights. And I'm especially honored uh, to tell you that Dr. Amy Kelly of Sioux Falls and Dr. Marv Beener of Rapid City have agreed to co-chair Doctors for Freedom, a group that will be working with us to try to inform voters about Amendment G, the Freedom Amendment, and to also um, explain to the public how important abortion access is to the, um, to the quality of healthcare available to girls and women in South Dakota. Uh, let me first introduce Amy Kelly. And Amy, uh, would you like to say, uh, give some thoughts about um, how you see Doctors for Freedom playing a role and uh, some of the core beliefs that prompt you to get involved in this? Um. Yeah, I'm hopeful that we can inform the dialogue <clears throat> that is going on about the amendment regarding abortion um, in South Dakota, as we're the ones who are dealing with this on the ground. Um, and we're seeing the real, actual lives being changed and being affected by um, the abortion ban. And how that could, and how ending the abortion ban could very much help us. Um, so hopefully we can put some, inject some reality into what I'm sure will be a little bit of a contentious, very rhetoric-filled um, issue as money and people from out of state pour in to discuss it. I just want to make sure that the people, and especially the women of South Dakota, are being heard. Amy, would you tell folks a little bit about uh, your own professional background, and then maybe, if you will, uh, give some examples about um, of cases where it concerns you that the abortion ban uh, is, is interfering with your freedom as a medical professional? Yeah, so um, I've had, I um, am actually a South Dakota native. I grew up here, um, and then I left South Dakota for several years um, to go in various different places, um, including Iowa and Minnesota and Indiana for my training. Um, and I moved back here in 2011. Um, so a while ago now, gosh, I can't believe I've been here for that long. Um, and I've been practicing here since 2011. Um, I do do general obstetrics and gynecology, but I have a special emphasis in pediatric and adolescent gynecology. Um, so I do quite a bit of that as well. Um, unfortunately, you know, working at a tertiary care center, um, well, fortunately, I'm glad I work at a tertiary care center, um, but we see kind of the worst of the worst in Sioux Falls. Um, and that's because anything that's really complicated or someone who is really early in pregnancy and is likely to have an early delivery is sent to Sioux Falls because we are the only place that has NICUs. Um, and so unfortunately, it is not uncommon for us to deal with situations like second trimester um, PPROM. It's not unusual for us to deal with bleeding issues right around periviability. Um, and we also see quite a few people who um, are pregnant with significant medical issues um, where we would normally offer them a termination because of their medical concerns. Um, most of those people were using birth control and it failed. So, you know, these are not irresponsible people by any means. They're just people who their contraception didn't work. Um, and they're in a bad situation. Um, so we kind of get all of that here in Sioux Falls. And I can honestly say like, it really is almost weekly that we're dealing with something that makes me pause and think, okay, is this legal? Do I need to think about this more? Do I need to call ethics? 
or do I need to bounce this off a partner to make sure I'm thinking about this correctly? Um, and second guessing those decisions because of the abortion ban. Dr. Bina, would you introduce yourself, tell uh, the folks a little bit about your professional background and, um, and why you feel so strongly about this issue? Sure. Um, uh, I uh, went to medical school at Baylor. I did a family practice residency first, and then I did an OB residency because I just fell in love with the obstetrics part. Um, I practiced in Northern California for three years, but I moved to Rapid City in 1993, uh, and I worked for the Rapid City Indian Health Board for three years doing Native American care before I went into private practice, and I've been doing that ever since. Um, here in Rapid City, I share a lot of the same concerns and the same problems we have here that Amy talked about in Sioux Falls, but we're also in the middle of a maternity care desert <clears throat> with very with not nearly enough obstetricians providing prenatal care. So, Rapid City is also the referral ground for everything in Western South Dakota. And that includes, you know, at least two of the reservations and all of the rural areas where people don't have access to prenatal care. That's getting worse and worse. Um, I'm looking forward to retirement next month. Um, another obstetrician in town is also stopping uh, obstetrical part of their practice. Uh, leaving probably half the providers that we need. And so the acuity of patients that we're seeing here referred to Rapid City is getting worse and worse as people have less and less access to prenatal care. And the problems they have have become much greater in magnitude and frequency. And so like Amy, we have patients that come in in the second trimester periviability or previability in their gestation with significant medical problems, uh, premature rupture of membranes, as she mentioned, sometimes fetal anomalies, so many things where the part of the conversation about their care has to include pregnancy termination. But we can't offer that here. And several times in the last month, I've had to tell patients <clears throat> that in other states, this is part of the conversation we would be having, but I can't offer you that here. And if you think that's the best for your care, then we'll have to arrange transfer to another state. And it's becoming more and more common and it's gonna become even more common after I retire, I'm afraid. Oh, and also related to that is I was unable to sell my practice. I could not find a buyer for my practice. I couldn't find a healthcare institution to take over my practice. And part of it is because it's so hard to recruit obstetricians here. And I think part of that has to have to do with the fact that we can't offer a full complement of obstetrical care here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, you know, we're always, we're growing by leaps and bounds in um, Sioux Falls. And we're always, you um, kind of trying to bring in folks that we know. We keep track of medical students that have left South Dakota to go do an OBGYN residency program because we don't have one here in the state. Um, and we keep track of them because we try to, you know, rule them, roll them back in here um, because they have, they have family connections. And a lot of times getting good physicians, it, we get them because they have good family connections and they know that South Dakota is a good place to live in general. Um, it's become so much harder to recruit. And it's not just OBGYNs because a lot of OBGYNs are married to other physicians. And so, or, you know, when you're first starting your practice, just getting out of residency, that's when you have babies. You don't want to go to a state where if something happens to you, you don't have options. Doctors are also patients. And so this is affecting all medical fields. Um, and you can even see it in residency numbers. You can see it nationwide where um, less and less medical students are applying to residencies in states with abortion bans. Um, they don't want to be patients and they don't want to be doctors in those states. Um, so yeah, it's going to become more of an issue. It's already really hard to recruit to South Dakota. We lost, we had two IVF doctors here. We lost one of them. Um, and we're not going to get another one until this abortion ban is gone. We're just not. Um, and unfortunately the one we have is close to retirement. 
Um, I, you know, I think he'll work for a while, but I mean, he's not gonna work forever. Um, and then what are women going to do that need IVF? They're going to have to go to Omaha or Minneapolis, um, you know, or Denver if they live on the other side of the state. Are the two of you alone among your OBGYN colleagues in um, supporting the amendment? Heavens no. <laughs> I'd say the vast majority of obstetricians here, with maybe one or two exceptions, are uh, incredibly upset about the abortion ban, the trigger law. Many of my colleagues worked alongside of me years ago with the other abortion bans that we managed to overturn. Um, no, I think we're, we are definitely in the majority um, in supporting Amendment G. I would totally agree. Um, and realistically, there are many other physicians that are not in obstetrics and gynecology that are also in support because they see how it affects their patients, psychiatrists, pediatricians, um, cardiologists, because honestly, a lot of the people who have really significant health concerns in pregnancy are people who have significant cardiac issues. Um, nephrologists, women who are on dialysis are at huge risk if they accidentally get pregnant. So those specialties, oncologists, women who can't get the cancer care they need if they become pregnant. All of these physicians know how important the full spectrum of reproductive health care is. Um, so we're certainly not alone in our specialty, nor are we alone in the House of Medicine. I know the group is called Doctors for Freedom, but are you open to other health care professionals too? Absolutely. Um, I would say many of the people who have asked to join are nurses, um, particularly labor and delivery nurses and pediatric nurses, um, partly because that's my world. <laughs> and so those are the nurses I know, um, but partly because like they see the reality of what women go through. You know, they see that in the last couple of years, women with babies that have fatal anomalies we can't take care of them here. They have to go to Minnesota. We used to take care of them here. We used to love them. We used to support them when they delivered their fetuses that were never going to survive. We have perinatal hospice. I mean, these are people that we deeply care about. We deeply care about our patients. Um, and so nurses, for sure, there are many of them that are on board. Um, I've also had psychiatrists, psychologists, uh, many other people who are interested. I, I think that's absolutely true too. And I think about all the nurses in labor and delivery, all the nurses in my staff, all of my employees, mm -hmm. um, almost to a T, almost to a, a person, people are opposed to this ban. And, um, and it doesn't matter what their political party is. It's, it's across the board that, I mean, the vast majority of people in South Dakota, and I would say an even higher majority of women are opposed to this ban and for all the obvious reasons that we just talked about. What would you like other doctors and nurses and other healthcare professionals to do uh, to help you with this project? I think just speaking about the truth about what happens in healthcare and behind closed doors. Losing a baby, whether you needed to do so because in order to save yourself or whether you had a baby with fatal birth defects um, is really an awful, awful thing to talk about. Um, I've had patients who didn't even really tell their families what was going on. Um, and so it's really hard for patients to come forward. So I think that, you know, we have to be respectful of privacy. You know, obviously doctors are, um, can't, you know, give names and tell exact details of stories. You know, we kind of change those things a little bit in order to keep um, our patients' privacy. But I think talking about like what we have seen as healthcare providers and what our patients have gone through, um, and the reality of reproductive care is really important. People who don't work in our field, they don't always understand. They don't understand that abortion care is really integral to what we do as OBGYN. Even if we've never worked in a Planned Parenthood, um, it's still part of like what we do for patients sometimes in order for them to be healthy. Um, so I think, and I think nurses and other physicians know this, 
Um, so I think I would just encourage people to like talk to their friends, neighbors, like tell patient stories, tell the stories that patients can't tell themselves. Um, and I think that's super helpful. I think people in South Dakota care about each other. Um, and I think that when they realize that like their neighbors can be affected by this and the abortion ban is not just some political gamesmanship, but that it's actually affecting people that they may know and love, I think then it means it means something different. Yes, I would, I agree with all of that. And I would also add that, um, that the future of healthcare for uh, all of our daughters and granddaughters um, are dependent on this. I know you've already got maybe a couple dozen or so people, um, mostly doctors, some nurses and others, uh, who have committed to saying, you know, to standing up and saying, yeah, I'm part of this group. Um, if there are others that would like to join you, I understand they can um, contact you through Doctors for Freedom at thepotensforhealth.com. Is that the best way for them to get in touch with you? Um, I think so, yes. Um, you know, obviously, to be honest, like, we probably have our own social networks as well. So people who know how to get in touch with us in other ways, I think that's fine okay. too. Um, but just for the general public who don't know us personally or professionally, I think that would be the best way to get a hold of us. Yes. All right. Anything else the two of you want to say before I open it up for questions? I guess I would just say I'm, I'm proud to be part of this. Um, I, I, the only way to change things is to get involved and to be active and to step up and and tell the truth about what's going on and what we need to do. And I'm just proud to be a part of it. Okay. Any of the guests uh, have questions for Dr. Kelly or Dr. Bina? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll go first. Um, Dr. Kelly, uh, first of all, nice to meet you. My name is Grant Green. I'm with Dakota News Now. Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, obviously the, the rule in South Dakota is uh, included that it, there's only exception of preserving the life of the pregnant female. And you mentioned having to um, refer about, like, you know, to others whether or not, you know, what kind of procedure if the procedure qualifies as that um is there something you know that would make it even the slightest bit more easier to understand whether or not what you are doing is um you know preserving the life of a female or is it just legally so confusing regardless like to keep it short is there one thing that could be put in to make this even Ten, like 10 times easier for you? Um, to be honest, I don't think so. Because, you know, there, there's no way to make a list of all the things in pregnancy that could be dangerous for a woman. Because um, a, a list is going to be different for different women too. Um, and if you try to make a list of things, something is always going to get left off. There's just not a way to really encompass all the crazy things that can happen during pregnancy really um and i think that the hard thing is that it's really hard to legislate um specific medical things our medical knowledge changes all the time our standards of care change and so it's really hard to put things in the law that are super super specific um, and I don't have a crystal ball as much as my patients wish I did. And sometimes I wish I did. I don't have a crystal ball. And I don't know if someone losing three liters of blood is going to be enough to put them in a cardiac arrest, or if they're going to have to lose four, like, and I shouldn't be asked to wait until someone is that sick. If I know it's headed towards the toilet and towards like not good things and not a good outcome for that patient, I should be able to intervene early if that is what the patient wants. Um, and it, and I think the bottom line comes down to like, who is just making these decisions? 
Who is deciding, you know, if your risk of pre in pregnancy of dying is 30%, which is kind of, which is true for a couple of cardiac defects, actually. Um, who gets to decide if you're willing to take that 30% risk? Is it you? Is it me? Is it the government? And I think that's just kind of the bottom line is like, we need to trust women and physicians that together they can make the best decisions for themselves and their families. Other questions? Yeah, um, so this morning, the South Dakota State Medical Association said that um, they are taking no position on um, the abortion ban or um, amendment G. I just was wondering um, either of the, the doctors here today have anything to say about that or um, you know, about the taking no position and um, with other you know, medical professionals in the state. Um, so I'm actually on the policy council for the South Dakota State Medical Association. Um, and what, while I wasn't involved in all the conversation about that, um, I think that it is really hard for medical associations um, to come out um, in favor, in 100% favor of this amendment. There are some limits to this amendment. And I also, you know, I also work with ACOG and I will tell you that ACOG is not going to endorse the amendment either, but we do, but ACOG will definitely say this is better than an abortion ban. It's just not enough. Like this is our, our um, amendment really, really reflects the language of Roe, which I think for, for some people is Roe is the ceiling and as Roe is the floor and not the ceiling, meaning Roe is the bare minimum of what we need for women. I think that as a physician, this amendment is so much better than the ban we have now. It takes criminalization off the table. It makes my job a hundred percent easier. But for a lot of medical organizations, and I suspect for, you know, some other big organizations that are national and have South Dakota chapters, um, it may be difficult for them to take a black or white position on this because it may not, um, it may not align with what their national organization believes. Because like I know ACOG, does not want to have any government interference in um, abortion care. And this does keep the door open for some interference in later pregnancy. Um, and I don't necessarily think that's a terrible thing. You know, I think in South Dakota, we also have to be mindful of, of the state we live in, the politics we have here. But for many national organizations, this amendment doesn't go far enough. I, I can add a little historical perspective to the medical association's involvement in this issue when uh, South Dakota banned abortion in 2005 and tried to again in 2007. I was involved with the medical association then, and I remember arguing about this and the, and the medical association's position on this. They decided not to take a position on the ban in the referendum for the ban, but they did adopt the AMA's um, opinion, like Amy said, that they oppose government interference into um, the uh, physician, the physician patient relationship and physician uh, practice of medicine. Um, so they didn't, they did not overtly support overturning the ban, but it was clear that that was the message. And when they polled the physicians at that time, 80% of physicians that were uh, polled in the medical association opposed the abortion ban at that time. Um, and and, I, and would, I think. I would say Marv, I think that it actually is probably more now. I think there are very few people in the medical association speaking as, speaking as a policy council member, not speaking for them, but just knowing many of the people in the organization, I would actually say it's probably much higher now, people who would, who would oppose an abortion ban. Um, the medical association here in South Dakota has 
over the last 15 years since I've been here and been involved has gone from me being the only woman in the room to half of us being women. So it's, it's changed a lot. And so I would really suspect that that would at least be the case still, Marv, um, as it was back, you know, almost 20 years ago now. Um, yeah. And I will also say that the national AMA, so the American Medical Association, the national association has come out and said that abortion is healthcare that it is part of healthcare, it is needed, and they have strongly come out in favor of um, the entire comprehensive um, reproductive options. And, um, you know, even if our state medical association hasn't, the House of Medicine is very much behind not having abortion bans and allowing women the freedom to choose um, how and when to have their children. Yeah, thank you. Um, that that was um, my only question. Other than, what are your guys? Where are you guys both practicing currently right now? I know our needs to be private practice, and then um, Dr. Kelly, um, are you still at Sanford? Is from what I just quick googled, or are you somewhere else? <laughs> yeah, yes, I am. But I think it's really important to know that I'm not. I'm speaking for myself. I'm not speaking okay. for my place of employment. Okay. And I'm in private practice. I deliver babies at Monument. I operate in several different places. Um, I've worked part time for uh, Native uh, Native Women's Health Clinic, which was a 638 program designed for Native American women's health care. Um, and that's that's my that's my affiliation professionally. Any other questions? Yeah, I just had a couple, sorry. Um, yeah, so going back to uh, Dr. Kelly, uh, you had mentioned earlier that um, I believe Sanford has lost two IVF doctors and then one is retiring, right? No, we had two and we lost oh, one. Lost yeah, one and so, the other one's retiring? So, uh, no, I have no idea when Dr. Hansen is retiring. Please oh. don't report that he's retiring. Oh. He would be mad at me. <laughs> Um, oh, okay. But Dr. Keith Hansen is the only one left. Um, and, you know, and he's older than me. I'm actually not 100% sure how old he is, but I feel like he's probably approaching his 60s. And I mean, I do. He's not a young man. He's a great person. Don't get me wrong. But he's much closer to retirement than he's not than, you know, than I am. And I'm not a spring chicken either. Um, so I just, uh, I just worry for access for our, our patients. Um, we did have two IVF doctors and we we're trying to recruit a third because our IVF clinic is, is crazy. Like it's just so, 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 so busy there. Um, there's not enough of them. Um, and then we lost one. And so now we only have one and we yeah. would like to have three. So Right. And, and, and so my, my question was, you know, with this issue of abortion and, you know, South Dakota has been very tight on what is allowed in the case of abortion. But what, what's making it so tough to bring in uh, those that specialize in IVF treatment? So it's really hard to do IVF without um, discarding embryos. So and. And the process of IVF just automatically, you do discard some embryos. Most of the time it's, you're discarding embryos that stopped growing or embryos that are not um, mature enough or normal, like they're not normal looking. And so you're not using them to implant, but no matter what with IVF, you almost always make more embryos than will become children. Um, and some people who oppose abortion um, also feel that that is not okay, that you shouldn't make embryos that are going to be discarded. Um, and some abortion laws, depending on how they're written, can impact IVF care. Um, just like suddenly in uh, Alabama earlier this year when they, or yeah, was it Alabama? Yeah, yes. where they where they had issues because suddenly embryos were children, and then no one would even touch embryos in the whole state because if 
that court ruled that embryos were children and had the rights of and you know were worth what children are worth you know basically i mean children are are priceless right but um then no one would do anything with those embryos they wouldn't implant them because what if you accidentally drop an embryo on the floor did you commit murder if you um transport embryos so i had friends that had embryos um stored there and they couldn't even get their embryos to a different state to use because no transport company would transport them because how do you insure children what if something happened during transport would you get charged with murder if you know the embryos weren't at the right temperature and got destroyed on transport i mean like insurance companies wouldn't insure them to be moved so i mean basically there are everyone in alabama couldn't do anything with their embryos until the state did some you know some magic movement around some wording but i mean th this is how abortion laws imp and fetal personhood laws impact ivf and i think it's important for women to know that lots and lots of women have babies with ivf it's very 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 common um and we will have a really hard time recruiting another reproductive endocrinologist and infertility specialist with an abortion ban in our state because they are worried the same things that happen in Alabama will happen here. And I don't blame them. Other questions, anybody? I know at least one of these doctors uh, may have to rush to a delivery room pretty soon, and I'm sure uh, the other one is busy too. So uh, it will yeah. wrap it up unless anybody's got some more questions. Yeah, I just had... <laughs> oh, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to ask about um, the kind of, bless you, uh, the conversation, and bless you, uh, sorry, it's my colleague. Um, is there a tension between sort of the um, the, the kind of healthcare uh, aspect of abortion and kind of more of the, the social aspect of it, which, and could somebody talk maybe a little bit about that in terms of of where the conversation has has kind of been historically and i have another um question after that as well does that make sense um i don't know what you mean by the social aspect like the uh, the kind of uh health versus like elective uh as like a as like a birth control uh sort of procedure that that some have kind of worried about historically um uh in the state and across the country and sort of the, the tension about like what you see in in like um your own uh practice and, and settings there i think the only people who say something like like abortion is used for birth control are people who aren't in healthcare. People who are in healthcare know that's not the reality. That is a political topic, talking point. Half of people who get abortions, even in the first trimester, they used birth control and it failed them. Um, so, I mean, I think that that's just a misnomer. That's trying to marginalize women who are having abortions for reasons that some people think are not okay. Um, and, and, and and my point is who gets to decide what's okay it shouldn't be the government right and also if you look at the statistics the vast majority of women who have abortions either already have children or will go on to have more children mm -hmm. um and um yeah it's just it's just a mistaken notion to call elective first trimester abortions um birth control especially in a state like south dakota where it's so difficult to get one yeah, it's, I mean, people who have, women who have abortions and moms are not two separate groups. They're the same people yes. at different points in their life. Um, Follow-up question. I think you've done uh, a really good job of sort of laying out um, sort of the provider uh, shortage that we're seeing currently. Could you maybe contextualize that a little bit more? Do we know how many OBs have been certified in the state since the since the trigger law went into effect um, and maybe what we're anticipating going into the future. If something like this doesn't pass or or if, if current conditions persist. Um, well, I can tell you that we have had a harder time recruiting. We just don't have a we just don't have as many people to pull from. Um, I know of three residents currently who were hoping to come back to South Dakota, but won't. 
like three people who graduated from USD who are now in OBGYN residency who will not come back to South Dakota now because of the abortion ban. South Dakota only has like 80 OBGYNs. I mean, more than half of our counties have no, no people who do deliveries. Um, so, I mean, even losing one OBGYN is a huge loss for our state. Um, I don't know what how hard it's been to recruit people um, in Rapid City or in the western part of the state because I don't I'm not there. But I know that my colleagues at my location and across the across the city the last two the last two three years have been quite haven't been very easy to find people. Um, I know we've had several people leave the state. Um, we have a new partner coming soon. Um, and we've had a couple of new people in the last four years, um, four to five years. But I mean, every year we have less and less candidates to choose from. And in Rapid City, I can tell you that not long ago, maybe six, seven, eight years ago, we had twice as many OBGYNs as we have now. And we've lost those those numbers to people moving away, people retiring um and only one new OBGYN has moved into town I think during that period of time so we're we're down to half of what we had and we're going to be less than half when I quit and the other OB stops doing OB mm -hmm. but that's really a secondary effect that people don't always think about it isn't just that um the ban denies women access to abortion it may simply deny women access to OBGYN care at all. And I, I know that the uh, Commonwealth Fund um, reported uh, its latest study results, I think just last week, and that was one of the points they made, is, is it isn't just cutting off access to abortion, it ends up cutting off access to, to OBGYN services in general because of the, uh, because of the effect that it has on um, doctors not coming to or else not staying in states with bans like South Dakota's. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that sometimes gets lost and people don't realize it's, it isn't just the women or girls that would be in need of abortion that are being disserved. It's a lot of the rest of us too, because we just don't have the doctors with the specialty we need. Yeah. I mean, I can say several of my partners have said out loud that, and including me, that if I was coming out of residency now, I wouldn't come back to South Dakota. I wouldn't even look for a job here if I was a resident graduating now. And several of my colleagues have said the same. I mean, it's, it's harder better. to move once you're established, um, you know, once your kids are in school, once you have a partner that lives here and has a job here too, that's that's different. It's hard, it's hard to leave. But I think about leaving every week too. And think about it. There's no other part of medical care that's been criminalized. And so why would somebody go to a state where part of routine medical care has been criminalized? It just makes no sense. Yeah. I had just one more question. Um, so uh, I'm sure Dr. Kelly, you might refer people to like Minnesota. And mm -hmm. if you wanted to talk about that, that'd be nice too. But Dr. Buner, I, I was curious, you know, I understand that most of the political landscape, at least I believe like, you know, Montana, and I, I'm just asking you, what, where are you referring people that are in considering kind of getting an abortion, and, you know, how far they have to travel in those struggles? Well, for us on the western side of the state, um, there are places in Wyoming, of all places, but Denver, Fort Collins, uh, Omaha, um, they're all quite a ways away. There are hundreds of miles away, but that's as close as we can get. Yeah. Yeah. And I typically refer people to Minnesota, um, partly because it's close to here. Obviously, I mean, I can drive five minutes and be in Minnesota from my office. Um, so it's very close. Um, but just because it's close ish, I mean, it's still four hours away for most people. And um you have to take your day a day off of work or maybe multiple days off of work. You have to get childcare. You have to get a ride. You have to be able to afford all of those things. So, you know, even saying that it's quote unquote close, 
doesn't make it within reach for people. And when you're talking about medical issues, so if you have someone who has a significant medical issue, they may need inpatient care. So if their insurance won't cover that, it might just not be an option for them. So I have had, a, I recently had a patient with a severe cardiac issue who had a very high chance of dying in pregnancy, um, who I referred her to the University of Minnesota because she was not a candidate for an outpatient procedure, not a candidate for a medical abortion because she, if she lost too much blood, she'd go into heart failure. And she's fully anticoagulated, meaning she's on blood thinners and she can't get off of them. It would be too dangerous for her to be off of them for too long. So she needed an inpatient procedure and her insurance declined to pay for it. Um, and so she got stuck doing an outpatient procedure and taking the risk that if she lost too much blood, she'd go into heart failure and she wouldn't be at a hospital because that was her only choice. And that is just unconscionable. When two years ago, I could have taken care of her right here in her hometown. Okay, I think we'll wrap it up. I want to thank Dr. Kelly and Dr. Dina most sincerely both for doing this in the first place, but especially them for taking the time this afternoon to talk to everybody. And I thank every one of you who joined us. Um, I know Grant asked, and uh, some of the rest of you might be interested to know, this has been recorded. And so uh, a link will be sent out after the Zoom in case any of you want to review a recording of it. Thank you so much. Thank you.